Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with B.B. Anderson, Vice President of the U.S. Legal Program of the Center for Reproductive Rights, the only global legal advocacy organization dedicated to reproductive rights. B.B. has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, B.B., for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. I'm pleased to be here. So tell us about what is encompassed by the term reproductive rights. Well, reproductive rights is a broad term, and one of the things that's really key to the Center for Reproductive Rights is that we recognize that reproductive rights are fundamental human rights. And reproductive rights include the right to choose the timing and spacing of having children. It includes the right to access quality, safe reproductive health care, including not only care related to um, pregnancy, but also other sexual health care. And it includes um, the right to be able to continue and operate fully in society. So for example, in Africa we've been involved with situations where uh, young women are kicked out of school because they're pregnant. So it really, there's a huge span of what is encompassed within our work, uh, and there's a huge need for it throughout the world. And who has the right? Is it, is it men, women, children? elderly, grandparents, communities, who has the actual human right that you're describing? It's a human right and therefore every person has reproductive rights. And this is recognized in the U.S. Constitution, in the constitutions of some other countries, and in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so we work in, under, you know, national courts. We're involved with litigation under constitutional claims, federal, state in the U.S. and in other countries. We're involved with U.N. Uh, treaty monitoring bodies that work to enforce human rights throughout the globe and we work in regional courts again applying human rights principles because these are rights that are pr crucial for every person uh, from the time of birth throughout their existence as a as a person on the planet they have reproductive rights and we're there to help defend and protect those rights so when you talk about rights and you talk about human rights in particular and those rights have ex different types of expressions, not only in different societies, but in different actors within societies, individuals, men and women, um, young and old, uh, groups. Uh, talk about how the, those rights are honored within the different context um, in which those, those exist. How does one organization pursue rights that might indeed have different expression within different contexts? Well, that's an excellent question. And one of the, um, we sort of divide our work to, within the U.S. legal program and U.S. policy and advocacy program and then our global legal program. So when we're working in the U.S., it, certainly our legal work is focused on the U.S. Constitution, state constitution, and to some extent, you know, laws and regulations as well, mm -hmm. but primarily constitutional basis in the U.S. Our work globally is mostly focused on um, the human rights that have been established under, starting with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and then embodied in particular in various treaties. So we have the uh, Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women as, as one example. The Convention Against uh, Torture is another example. And so each of those treaties, various countries throughout the world sign and endorse those treaties. And even when they haven't endorsed particular treaties, they often are part of um, mechanisms and regional groups that embrace at least some of the human rights. And so what the Center for Reproductive Rights has done throughout its history is work to give meaning to those rights that are in the Universal Declaration and that are in these treaties and to in help enforce those. Sometimes that turns into work to amend a country's constitution. So for example, in Nepal, we had such tremendous success in getting their constitution to recognize uh, the right to terminate a pregnancy. So again, we work in national courts in other countries, but it is all embedded in the, hu the human rights that have been recognized um, and adopted, at least in theory, by countries throughout the globe. And we make that a reality. So you are working within the setting and within the context of agreements already forged uh, at times when those agreements seem to be contradictory, you try to create clarity, as you as you mentioned in the in the Nepalese uh, situation. Um, but then you also uh, try to assure that agreements that have been reached, whether embedded in a constitution or in a legal framework, that those are honored in practice. Yes, that's right. So that 
a lot of our work early on globally was um, more advocacy work to give meaning to the basic rights and a lot of work with, you know, again, UN bodies and interpretations of those. And then over time, we've increased the amount of litigation that we've done um, based on those, you know, to implement the treaties or to implement other um, human rights that countries have agreed to right. be responsible for and to, again, to give meaning to those. So there's an implementation at that level where we're actually in trying to enforce what the country has said that they've signed on to. There's another very important implementation is that once we get a decision, it often is requires a lot of work to make sure that the decision becomes a reality in individual women's lives. And, and, you know, again, these are rights of every human, but most of our work is on behalf of women because it's, it's women's reproductive rights that are most under assault, not only in the U.S., but throughout the world. So let's take it uh, back to the United States. So within the constitutional framework of, of our system of government, let's start off with the Constitution, and then let's start breaking it down, because the Constitution is one part of our, uh, of our legal framework, and then, of course, there are other elements. So let's talk about reproduction in the Constitution. I don't recall seeing the word reproduction in the U.S. Constitution or in any of its amendments. It isn't specifically s stated in the Constitution, but like many of the rights that are recognized as being fundamental rights under our United States Constitution, the principle is embodied. And the principle is embodied in the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which recognizes both the rights of equal protection under the laws and also due process rights that everyone is entitled to um, have throughout this country, and that has been long recognized as including a right to privacy and a right to liberty. And so the right of reproductive choice and the right of access to contraception and other aspects of being able to access reproductive health care has been recognized now for many decades as being embodied in those principles of equality, liberty, and privacy that are indeed in the U.S. Constitution. The pursuit of happiness, the, the freedom from various forms of coercion, and so on and so forth. And then when you go beyond the Constitution, these rights are more explicitly uh, expressed in certain national laws as well as in uh, state frameworks. So talk about that. Right. Some of the state constitutions explicitly recognize a right of reproductive choice or explicitly recognize, have the word privacy mm -hmm. or liberty specifically in their constitution. Many others have been interpreted as has the U.S. Constitution as By the courts. By the courts as recognizing that what, to give meaning, again, to give meaning to the constitution and to give meaning to what the um, provisions of the constitution are supposed to uh, provide in terms of rights to And since in our system we build on precedent, we build on interpretation and, and subsequent interpretation is reliant on precedent set by previous interpretation, these interpretations, particularly with the weight of history behind them, end up be having the weight of settled law. They have the weight of settled law and also they really, it is, the, the courts are working with um, making the Constitution a living document and a real document that really has relevance and protects the rights of individuals throughout society. So it's not only in this area, it's in other areas as well that this process you've just described goes forward. And that indeed, um, it's been clearly recognized in this country now for decades that for women in particular to have a meaningful right as guaranteed by the Constitution to participate fully in society, they must be able to have the right to access reproductive health care to enable them to control um, when they are preg become pregnant and whether or not they continue a pregnancy. And that has been, again, well settled and recognized as being fundamental to the rights that are set forth in the Constitution. So in terms of the programmatic span of, of work that you do, on the one hand, you actively participate in the courts to advance um, and certainly protect those areas of the law that, that you would deem to be uh, settled. Um, but there, there's also an advocacy element and a programmatic element of what you do. Describe those two elements and, uh, and how these uh, fit together and how you actually manage the process of, of advancing those rights. Well, throughout the history of the Center for Reproductive Rights, focusing on our U.S. work, we've always been in the courts to uh, make sure that the rights that are set forth in the Constitution are indeed um, obtainable for everyone and, and that they're enforced and they're protected. 
And so we've always worked in the, cons um, in the courts in that manner. We've also always worked in legislative advocacy, because as I'm sure you're aware, in the United States there is a constant assault on reproductive rights at the state legislative level in particular. And so we've always been involved in advocacy in trying to both get good provisions enacted into law that really provide access to reproductive health care and meaningful reproductive rights, and also to block uh, efforts to reduce access to reproductive health care and to curtail reproductive rights. What we've done in more recent years has really expanded our toolkit at the Center for Reproductive Rights, and we're involved in adv advocacy increasingly in more venues. So we've all, again, also been involved throughout our history with advocacy with um, executive agencies and certainly with uh, both federal and state, but we've increased our staffing to do more of that and to work even more with local grassroots organizations on policy and advocacy initiatives in individual states and ones that affect entire regions or the entire country. Do you, when you set your priorities, because in any nonprofit, of course, with limited budget and resources need to be most effectively deployed, do you set your priorities according to where uh, these rights are most under assault? Um, or are you trying to build on previous successes to, to extend the territory of that success? Um, do, you go, do you go where you're weak? Or do you go where you're strong? Well, we, we go where we're most needed, is mm -hmm. how I would put it. And so what we're doing is, in every individual case, we are working to um, deal with the situation facing that particular state by a particular law. But we're doing it in a way that also strengthens the constitutional protections. So simultaneously, we're working for the longer game of increasing the protections that will be relevant throughout the country, but we're going where it is most needed. So for example, we are the organization that is keeping the last clinic that provides abortion services in Mississippi open. We're the ones keeping the last clinic in North Dakota open. We are keeping the clinics in Louisiana open and the ones in Texas, we are fighting there to make sure that the devastation of access to access in Texas is stopped. So we go, we go, we fight where it's hard to fight. We fight in states where the courts are not necessarily um, receptive to our arguments, knowing that we are enforced, working to enforce the constitutional rights, and we may very well end up in the Supreme Court actually very soon in several of our cases. Um, but we, again, we have to go where we can make a difference, where we can try to work to protect those rights, enforce those rights, keep those clinics open, keep women able to have access to services so that the right that is supposed to be available to every woman in this country really is available to every woman in this country. So that's why we're fighting in Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, North Dakota, um, and not we're not in New York and California and fighting there. Others are doing great work there, but we're where those rights are so much under assault. Now, there is the counter-argument that you are protecting the rights of a child that has not yet been born. I find that to be very, a, a very interesting line of argument. What kind of arguments do you encounter in that, in that line of, of thinking? Well, certainly um, some of the restrictions are passed based on concern um, about fetal rights. And one of the things that our Constitution has recognized, that human rights principles recognize, is that birth is a significant event. Birth is, you become a person when you're born. And as I say, the Center for Reproductive Rights is working to ensure that from birth throughout life, people have access to reproductive health care services and an ability to exercise their reproductive rights. And what happens in some situations, some people believe that the fetus is entitled to equal rights or greater rights than the woman who has been born and who is, you know, a, a human being. So a fertilized egg, a zygote, would be, in that view, a person. People vary in their beliefs. I mean, this is part of what's the essence in this area. There is a, as you know, people have strongly held beliefs in this right. country and around the world about these issues, and in particular about the issues raised by the abortion issue, but also contraception. Um, and 
people's views differ. And some people view a zygote as being equal to a person. Others right. view a fertilized egg as being equal to a person. Other view, others view a fetus at a particular point as being equal to a person who has been born. And what society has is they have laws and they have you know, uh, human rights principles embodied in treaties and we have constitutions that recognize what are the rights that come with personhood. And one of those rights is reproductive rights. There's a variety of other rights, First Amendment rights, et cetera. And, but the society has recognized that that is a significant point and that is when your rights attach. And people are entitled to have different views. What they're not entitled to do is impose and then pass laws that make others unable to exercise their rights because of these personal views, often, you know, very, and again, often very sincerely, held yes, so passionately and sincerely held. Um, but not, it is not right to be able to impose those views on others and deprive others of the ability to exercise their different views and their, and their recognized constitutional rights. What, what was the reason that you decided in 2011 uh, to take this step of, of, of uh, joining the center and participate? What was, what was your personal reason for, for taking such a dramatic move with your career? Well, I had worked a lot um, in a variety of different functions as a, positions as a lawyer. Um, during my legal career, I'd worked for a very large New York law firm. Right. I'd worked for Legal Aid Society. I'd worked for another not-for-profit that did HIV work. I'd worked for a small firm that mostly did plaintiff's employment work uh, in California. But throughout my legal career, I always felt it was incredibly important to me to do something I felt was most meaningful and most impactful. And how could I use my legal skills to work on something I thought was really, really important. As a litigator yourself. Yes, and I, that was mostly what I had done as a lawyer um, in my career, as I had litigated. And I had certainly always cared about reproductive rights. I had volunteered with uh, NARAL and, and done phone banks and et cetera, but I hadn't worked in this area. Um, I'd worked in other public interest positions. And when this opening came up to work as a litigator at the Center for Reproductive Rights, I was I jumped at the opportunity and I was thrilled to get the job because, and the longer I worked in it, the just more impassioned I've become. We are working on something incredibly important. I knew that going in. But the wonderful thing in particular about the Center for Reproductive Rights is we work on these issues in really strategic, thoughtful, smart ways. And we do it, the fact that we do it throughout the globe, we do it throughout the country. We're willing to take the risky cases and go to the courts that we know are hostile. Um, is, it's inspiring. It's inspiring to work with the staff and, and to work with the clients we work with and to serve the women that, in particular that we're serving. So I've been thrilled to be able to spend many years. I actually started in 1998, left for a while. Um, I worked for many years, then left, but then came back to the Center for Reproductive Rights because um, it is just such a great place to work and I feel so energized every day in terms of what we're able to accomplish and how important it is that we keep working to accomplish those things. In terms of how the organization actually functions, uh, if you could just describe the extent of the uh, Center for Reproductive Rights operation uh, in the United States and how many staff you have, what your budget looks like and so on, I think that would be very helpful. Sure. Um, we have grown a lot. We were formed in June of 1992 is when we had our start. And so in the almost 23 years since then, we have grown. Um, and we've grown to meet, again, the need uh, that we've seen. So right now we have approximately 120 people on staff. We have our main office is in New York City, but we also have offices in Washington, D.C., in Kathmandu, Nepal, mm -hmm. in Bogota, Colombia, in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, and in Geneva, Switzerland. Our staff in the U.S. is a little under 100 with the rest of staff being uh, in those global locations. We have staff in New York who also work mm -hmm. globally. And we have, again, grown in terms of the tools that we've been able to use. We've added to our advocacy staff. We've engaged in increasing amounts of litigation in international um, court bodies and UN treaty monitoring bodies. Uh, we continue to do a very strong presence in courts throughout the country. We current, we had cases in approximately 25 states in the United States um, at various times. 
and we again under federal constitutions sometimes we're in state court under state constitutions and engaged in advocacy at state levels at local levels and at the federal level in the US and then again overseas worked heavily with partners in this in reproductive rights areas a lot of fellow advocates um, so we've been very active and we are we continue to be needed throughout the world and your how does your funding work our funding is about 55% um, foundations, oh sorry, about 45% foundations and about 55% individual donors. I hope I haven't switched that. Um, so it's close to half and half individual donors and foundations. We do not receive any government funds. Um, and we receive some additional money. We have a, now an annual gala. We also receive a tremendous amount of support of in-kind services by pro bono attorneys. So we have attorneys often from very major firms throughout the U.S. and also now internationally working with us on both our litigation and other matters as well. Well, B.B. Anderson, thank you so much for describing the work of the Center for Reproductive Rights, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you.